I'm Emily Kumler, and this is Empowered Health. This week on Empowered Health, we're going to look at the leading cause of death in women, which is heart disease. It turns out that heart disease is really sort of a multifaceted problem. Under that umbrella are a number of different kinds of conditions, some of which affect women much more than men. This week, we're going to be talking specifically about blockages in the small vessels of the heart, which disproportionately affect women. Men are more likely to have blockages in the big parts of their heart, which means the testing that most people get in an emergency room are looking at what the men get, not what the women get. This is definitely one of those episodes that we hope is going to charge you up to be your own advocate. We're going to kick it off by going to California. My name is Janet Way. I'm a cardiologist and um, the assistant uh, director of our Women's Heart Center, the Barbara Streisand Women's Heart Center at the Cedar sinai Smith Heart Institute. I'm also uh, the assistant medical director of the Cedar sinai Biomedical Imaging Research Institute and have interest in the sex differences of cardiovascular disease, specifically looking at pregnancy-related uh, heart issues uh, in women, as well as uh, women with chest pain. I feel like let's just start with some basics. Can you explain to us what the differences are? I mean, I feel like people think of like coronary heart disease, congestive heart failure, heart attacks, ischemia, all of these different things. Can you sort of break down what it is, specifically for women are the sort of differences or what these sort of, it seems like there's some catch-alls. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's an excellent question. When we refer to heart disease or cardiovascular disease, that is our catch-all term for heart attacks, for heart failure, for hypertension, also known as high blood pressure, um, stroke, as well as arrhythmias, so having abnormal electrical issues in the heart. And there are certain um, differences in women in which various components of these cardiovascular diseases, as well as risk factors for cardiovascular disease, manifest themselves. We know that for both men and women, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, is the leading cause of death. Over the past 20 years, due to improvements in our ways of um, treating men and women in um, treating acute heart attacks, death rates have actually been declining, fortunately. However, the death rates for young women with acute heart attacks. So what is young? Just to interrupt. You. Yes. Less than 60 years old. Okay. I love that definition of young. <laughs> <laughs> young, yes. There's been an increase in death rates for young women for related to acute heart attacks. And we need to really understand why uh, that is, because the discrepancies of the mortality in the past for men versus women used to be focused on discrepancies in what physicians are doing, for example, in the past, women were less likely, if they had an acute heart attack, to be treated. They would be less likely to be taken to a cath lab to have their blockages opened up if they were having a, a acute heart attack due to a blockage in their arteries. It was taking longer for them to be taken to the cath lab. And there were fewer women, after they had a heart attack, who were getting appropriate um, guideline-based medical therapy compared to men. And you guys call that the Yenta syndrome, is that right? Yeah, so the Yenta syndrome is, um, is related to that, exactly. So the idea is that women sometimes had symptoms that were due to a heart attack that were different from men. Um, chest pain is still the number one symptom that both men and, exper and women experience when they have a heart attack. But women are more likely than men to have more atypical presentations of that chest pain. They might experience it more as a chest pressure or a chest burning. And it's not always that classic Hollywood heart attack where 
typically a man is kind of clutching the center of their chest and complaining of an elephant, you know, sitting on their chest. Women may feel like, oh, this feels like heartburn or actually my jaw is hurting or I might be more short of breath rather than having chest pain. I might even be having nausea. So some of these atypical symptoms were what contributed to lower diagnosis rate of heart attacks in women and men. So if women's symptoms weren't being recognized as a heart attack because they were not similar to men, then they were getting misdiagnosed and then therefore not getting the appropriate treatment. So the symptoms that women present seem less acute, right? Like nausea versus like stabbing pain in your chest. And and so I, you know, I feel like the natural question then is are the heart attacks that women suffer from also less acute, right? Because there's a range of kind of heart attacks. Is that right? Heart attacks are are all acute. They all happen acutely. However, I think what you have uh, put a good point on is that there's often symptoms that lead up to a heart attack. So what we use the term is angina, usually what we refer to as chest discomfort due to the arteries in the heart not getting enough blood flow. And so women and men's angina symptoms or angina (laughs) symptoms are similarly different. Just as the acute heart attack symptoms may be different, these angina, more chronic angina symptoms may be different. And what we've learned through the um, National Institute of Health-sponsored Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation that was led by Dr. Noelle Berry Mers here at Cedars-Sinai, she's the director of our uh, Women's Heart Center, is that about half of women women who have angina and who go to um, have their arteries evaluated in the cath lab actually don't have obstructive coronary artery disease, meaning that they don't have big blockages in their arteries. Often their arteries may look normal on these angiograms. And what... Which is different than men typically, right? Yeah, men are more likely to have actual obstructive disease, meaning a big blockage, uh, more than 50% on the on, on the arteries, on the angiogram that, you know, it looks lumpy and bumpy, whereas women tend to have more diffuse disease in their arteries that is not causing a, nar- a significant narrowing um, on the angiogram. So when they present to their doctors and they t- say they've been having this chest discomfort and then they do the angiogram and, and it looks normal, then often these women are told, you know what, your arteries look normal, your heart is fine, the, this chest pain isn't due to your heart. And so this Y study, the Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation, has found that these women actually have problems with their small vessels. Uh, we call it microvascular disease. Coronary microvascular dysfunction is when all the tiny little vessels that actually play a very important role in the regulation of blood flow in our heart, they're responsible for actually over 75% of the blood flow in our heart, not the big arteries, that these are the vessels that are not working well They are not able to increase blood flow to the heart muscle in response to either exercise or even emotional stress, or they may actually constrict. So it's not a blockage in the smaller vessels. It's some other problem with them. Yes. It's more of a, it's more of a dysfunction. They're not able to dilate or relax as well. So we're going to head to the East Coast and get a better understanding of the sort of anatomy of the heart and where the blockages actually occur in women. My name is Dr. Julia Sheftel, and I'm a clinical non-invasive cardiologist at Noon Wellesley Hospital. And uh, basically, I see patients all day. I also spend a fair amount of my time as medical director of the Cardiac Ultrasound Lab at Newton Wellesley Hospital, where I'm very interested in uh, imaging and uh, cardiac ultrasound, echocardiograms. The heart is a muscle and it needs a blood supply like any organ in the body. And so I want you to think of the blood supply to the heart as an upside down tree. We're gonna start at the top, it's the trunk. And then there might be three or four large branches that take off from the trunk. And these branches, they subdivide 
into smaller and smaller branches. In effect, they arborize, right? To extend the analogy of the tree, they arborize. They get smaller and smaller and smaller until they bury into the heart muscle itself. So that is what we call the coronary anatomy. Coronary comes from the Latin coronarius, meaning crown. Some very inventive person thought that the arteries looked like, you know, a crown. So that's where the term coronary arteries sort of comes from. So that is the basic anatomy of the arterial tree. And what we're going to talk about today is the differences between men and women um, in terms of the anatomy of the arterial tree, uh, both in terms of the, the big trunks and the little tiny vessels, or what I call the twigs. So one of the things that is very interesting as we think about the differences between men and women is let's talk for a minute about the big branches. The top part of the tree, remember I said, you know, you've sort of got what we call a main trunk. In cardiology, we call it the left main. And that trunk branches into about, oh, three or four main branches, let's say. And so there are relatively big arteries. And so one of the things that research has uncovered is that men and women have a very different way of laying down what we call plaque. Plaque is a buildup of cholesterol in the pipes. And plaque is made up of fat and cholesterol and little bits of calcium. And interestingly enough, plaque, it's not just like a rusty pipe, because it turns out that there's a lot of inflammation going on in plaque, because lots of cells of the immune system reside in the plaque, and, and that becomes important. But it turns out that men and women have a very different way of laying down plaque which is similar to the way that they put on weight as they get older. Let's take a man. You might notice that as that man gets older, he's got skinny arms and skinny legs. But what happens to the belly? Gets bigger. We call it a beer belly. It's protuberant, right? And so that is sort of the male pattern of, of laying down fat. The actual anatomy of the heart is the same in men as it is in women. But what you're talking about is where the blockages occur, correct? Right. So the basic concept is the same. So yes, the anatomy of the heart is the same in men and women, right? It's a muscle. It's got heart valves. It has a blood supply. But what I'm talking about now is very specifically, I'm talking about the arterial tree or the plumbing, if you will. We're focusing on this aspect of heart disease, the arteries. And the analogy that I'm drawing is that as men get older and they deposit fat, they put it right in the belly. And what's fascinating is that if you look at a coronary angiogram, which is an invasive test. It's also called a cardiac catheterization. This is an invasive test whereby we put a little catheter or tube in a vessel in the groin. It's advanced to the heart, and then we shoot some dye under x-ray guidance, and we, we, we shoot some dye into the arteries of the heart, take x-ray pictures, and we can look for blockages. Turns out that in men, we often see great big blockages. The arteries are obviously plugged. But in women, we see a slightly different pattern, which is very analogous to how women gain weight as they get older, for example, in the menopause, which is that they seem to distribute fat everywhere. And I've had many of my female patients coming in, menopausal, perimenopausal, and they're very distressed because they're suddenly developing fat in areas like their belly or their arms where they never had it before. And it becomes very stubborn and resistant to get rid of them. So they're very unhappy about that. But it turns out, that if you look at the arteries of the heart in women on these coronary angiograms, you don't see these big obstacles, these big uh, plaques. It's the way that it's being deposited. It's the way that for whatever complexity of reasons, Mother Nature says, in a man, I'm going to deposit the plaque so it's just you know bulging into the pipe. But for women, the way that they lay down plaque is different because they lay it down kind of just not with one big focal bulge, but sort of all over the place, not just in the middle of the pipe, but along the walls of the pipe and sort of outwardly. So it's not so much that they're pushing it out. That's just more of a kind of an analogy, but that's the way the plaque is being deposited. 
So, and that's true pre and post menopause. You no, know, it's typically we see it most, you know, in fifty year old women and on. That that's is that women have non obstructive coronary artery disease more than men. So instead of having these huge obstructions, women tend to have more non obstructive coronary artery disease. That is to say, that is the way that they lay down plaque with this process of atherosclerosis which is that process of laying down plaque, that's how women do it. And so there is a very, very catchy word for that. Would you like to know what the word is? It's minoka. Inoka minoka. And that's the small vessel blockages. So inoka minoka stands for myocardial ischemia, infarction, and no obstructive coronary artery disease. Now, so would that be picked up in a cath lab if you went into the ER or no? So if you had a cardiac catheterization, which, by the way, is the gold standard test that we use to make the diagnosis of coronary artery disease, what you will find when you do these tests is that in women, more often than men, you will see non-obstructive disease. And that's what we call minoka. Uh, is, or minoka, inoka minoka. It stands for, it, I don't expect you to remember that, but the way that I think about it, these are mini plaques, mini for minoka, itty bitty plaques. So the heart is not getting enough blood flow, but it's not because of these huge plaques that are projecting into the pipe, but they have a lot of non-obstructed. They have small plaques that they deposit everywhere, just the way a woman, as she approaches menopause and perimenopause, is distributing adipose fat everywhere. So that is one of the differences. But another very important difference, as we're talking about the coronary arterial tree, is that one thing that can happen with Minoka which is non-obstructive disease, is a subset, a large subset of patients have problems with the tiny little blood vessels at the end of the tree, what we call the little arterioles. And it turns out that in women, more often than men, it's those little tiny blood vessels, circulatory dysfunction. I found Dr. Shaftel's explanation of where these blockages are happening to be really helpful. But one of the things that, again, is very frustrating is learning how little research there is on this. And so in her practice, when she is treating women who have these blockages, she's kind of winging it because there aren't any guidelines to instruct her sort of ability to diagnose and then treat with something that she knows is going to be effective. So she has to kind of personalize everything. She's going to explain to us next a little bit about how this is challenging. You know, doctors rely heavily on guidelines to treat patients. That's how we do it. Uh, guidelines inform clinical practice and they help and tell us what to do with any individual. Of course, there's always the art of medicine, but you always have to put it into context of the guideline. The, the, unfortunately, right now, there are no guidelines to treat coronary microvascular disease. There are some interesting studies that are ongoing there's a, a, a very well-known, wonderful researcher, Noelle Barry Mertz, and she's the head of the WISE study, which is the Women's um, Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation Study, a prominent researcher. And I believe there's a trial now that's enrolling only women, I think it's about 4,000 women, looking at, um, I believe it's aspirin and cholesterol medication to see whether we can improve outcomes in these women with small vessel disease because in the, in the old days, we used to brush it off. You know, the woman was anxious, no big deal. You've got nothing wrong with the big blood vessels, so uh, see you later. It's your reflux or it's your pinched nerve. But now we're coming to understand that the prognosis of these patients with small vessel disease is not benign. And um, there are ways, important ways to treat it. But again, we don't have guidelines. So a lot of it is just trial and error. Yeah, I mean, I think that's tricky because I think historically the guidelines have been all based on male bodies, right? So they haven't served women the way that they probably should have. And people would say like, well, their research, doubly blind clinical trial, you know, great, but there weren't any women in the study. So it's not actually that helpful, right? And I think 
there's obviously a lot of information coming out about women and cholesterol that seems to be, you know, interesting at the very least, it's sort of suggesting that total cholesterol is not a good indicator at all for women in terms of heart disease and that, you know, especially premenopausal women run higher with their HDL and adding that in somehow is not quite the right way of figuring some of this stuff out. Um, there's also a clinical trial that was done looking at the response women have to statins and how they're like four times more likely to develop diabetes if they've been put on a statin, which is a conversation a lot of doctors aren't having with their female patients when they decide to put them on statins. So I agree with you in general that like the more research, the better, but I feel like historically, I don't think women have been included in so many of the clinical trials that I'm not sure we can make that argument in terms of guidelines, because guidelines seem to be, you know, as we go towards precision medicine, I also would hope that we're going towards um, some pretty basic sex difference in terms of hormonal regulation and all these other things. Right. I, um, I agree. I think that there has been a vast, we know there's been a vast underrepresentation of women in clinical trials. And so I, I understand what you're saying is, you know, here I'm telling you that I I feel more comfortable following guidelines, and yet we know that much of that research has been done in men, and that's really the problem. That's the crux of the problem, that we're doing a one-size-fits-all here, which is why it's so incredibly important that we really step up the research game in women. A big thing that I think people don't realize is that, I'm going to come back to this, is that a woman is you know, much more likely to, to die from heart disease than, than breast cancer. Breast cancer these days is, I have many patients who are very well treated, but, you know, one in two women is, is going gonna, is gonna to get heart disease, uh, cardiovascular disease um, in their lifetime. And one in three are going to die from cardiovascular disease. And these are shocking statistics that, that, you know, that I think people, that I think people forget. And, and the important thing to recognize is that the disease seems to be gaining strength. The, this whole issue of atherosclerotic uh, coronary artery disease is gaining strength in younger women. Younger women, uh, smoking is on the rise, for example, at college campuses. And we are now seeing a rise in heart disease in young women. And that's a problem. That's a, that's a, that's a shocker. And so I think we need a way to popularize and to spread the word. I, th I think there have been tremendous campaigns that have raised awareness of heart disease in women, the Red Dress campaign, the American Heart, um, the NHLBI. But I think we're still kind of, for some reason, I think it still doesn't resonate with, with women. I, I remember an interesting story that, that my chief of cardiology gave me. A, it was a story about a woman who very dutifully accompanied her husband to all of his doctor's appointments, one doctor's appointment after another, and they were all terribly concerned about his health and preventing disease and treatment. Uh, and this went on, and then one day, uh, she died suddenly. So throughout all of these visits uh, to her husband's medical appointments, nobody ever bothered to, to take a look at her own health, and nor did she particularly seem to, to pay attention to it. And so there's been this um, this ongoing theme that uh, men are important, and they are, but that women should take care of men, and that's really what's the most important. And then if there's time and wherewithal left over, then women can start to take care of themselves. And I think we have reached a time where if women don't start taking care of themselves, remember, this is a lethal disease. Women can die suddenly and they disappear. They evaporate. Nobody knows about them because it's, it, it's often not a chronic disease. 50% of patients with cardiovascular disease can die suddenly. So that is a very shocking and scary thought. So it's important that we understand that heart disease is on the rise in women and that women need to stand up and advocate for themselves. And so along those same lines, I think one of the things that I, you know, I think, you know, you just sort of inherit as a bias is this idea that women live longer than men. So when you, when you hear statistics about like women are dying of heart disease, you know, it's the leading cause of death and the statistics that you just put out there, 50% can die suddenly. One of the things that I think allows people to discount it 
is this idea of like, oh, well, they're old, <laughs> right? Like we all have to die of something someday. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the interplay between estrogen and heart health and why that after, you know, sort of going through menopause becomes a really critical point of heart care, I guess, or heart, you know, concern for women. You know, when people enter the perimenopause, they can feel quite poorly with symptoms, hot flashes, sweats, a sleep disturbance. And, um, and so, and we used to think estrogen was good. We used to think it improved the cholesterol profile. We even used to give it for heart health in, in the older days. But then we found out that estrogen is indeed not good for the heart and that not only was it associated with an increased risk of breast cancer, but it also increased the risk for stroke and heart attack. Are you talking about the Women's Health Initiative? Like yeah. Women taking estrogen who are 65 or older, right? I think that's probably important to say. Right. In that subgroup of, of patients. But I don't think at this point in time, we do not prescribe estrogen for heart health. I think that if a woman's having you know, really bad vasomotor symptoms, we can recommend estrogen for the shortest period of time at the lowest doses, and I think we can get away with that. But so what is it about estrogen before a woman goes through menopause that is protective? Um, that's a really good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. What I do know is that we're really talking about blood vessels. And again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an estrogen specialist, but I think one of the things that um, you know, women suffer from is a disease of, um, of, of, of blood vessels, and women tend to be constrictors. They tend to constrict their blood vessels. I get a lot of women, for example, with migraine headaches or Raynaud's phenomenon, they constrict. And, you know, it's possible that when, the, with the loss of estrogen, that there are some abnormalities there. Um, this is an area of research, but, um, you know, estrogen may be protective in the premenopause, but I think the important take home point is it's not protective in the postmenopause. And the reasons why estrogen are protective, you know, I think that's a complex area of study. Is there any visualization that looks different in a premenopausal versus postmenopausal? Oh, that's a good question. I, I don't think it's so much that. I think it's just the disease process. You can have a young woman who has diabetes, a smoker, and she may have blood vessels that look like a 80 year old woman. You can have a 60 year old woman who's done a great job of taking care of her health, eating right, exercising, not smoking, and you know she can have relatively good looking vessels. So I think it depends more on the individual, not necessarily the, you know, the, the age. How much is it that we're diagnosing it more? I mean, I think it's also really interesting that this idea of these, you know, sort of smaller vessels or scab, like these other kinds of ways of identifying damage to the heart are relatively new, right? And so if those are getting diagnosed more in women, are we, does that account for the increase in instances, even though they were probably always having those problems? We just didn't know what to call it. I think we were always having the problems. We just never did enough research or never came to clinical attention. Again, I, I think this particular area is still somewhat in its infancy in terms of awareness. I think it's still in its infancy in terms of research. And again, it's research that informs guidelines, but people have to read the guidelines in order to, to treat patients. Because remember, medicine is a little bit the art, and it's also the science, and you have to do both of those things. Well, it's frustrating to hear that we don't have guidelines in place, we don't have enough research. I did want to go back to Dr. Wei and ask her why she thought this was different in women. So what is what is the reason for, like, why is the structure of the heart or the functioning of the heart or dysfunction, I guess, in this case, so different between women and men? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> I mean, my go-to is always like, what is, where is the estrogen, right? <laughs> like what's happening? Yes, right. We are, we are very interested in this and we have found that it's not completely explained by hormones. Um, men can have this problem too. And it's also not completely explained by traditional cardiovascular risk factors. So for example, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol are important um, risk factors that can contribute to both microvascular dysfunction as well as obstructive heart disease where there's big blockages. 
but particularly for the microvascular dysfunction, it, it doesn't explain it all. It explains only about 20% of the cases. So that's when we think about other causes such as inflammation. You know, women are more likely than men to have um, inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis is more common in women. Um, lupus is more common in women. And we are now finding that there are certain conditions specifically related to women, for example, premature menopause. So if a woman um, undergoes menopause earlier than 40 years old, they're at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease later in life. Women also who had um, certain adverse pregnancy outcomes, which are things like having high blood pressure during their pregnancy or a condition called preeclampsia or even um, having a preterm labor. So if, they're, if they had their baby early, earlier than 37 weeks of gestation, then that's been associated with uh, at least a twofold increase in future cardiovascular disease in life. So that's so interesting. I mean, I feel like I had a, an obstetrician that I have interviewed a bunch of times had said to me that one of the things that he loves about pregnancy is that it's also sort of this inflection point in overall health, that if you have an underlying condition, it often comes out during pregnancy because of the exactly. stress. Exactly. It's our first, it's a woman's first official stress test. Right. Uh, because our, our heart rate, our blood flow has to increase by at least 50% to accommodate extra flow to our, um, to our baby. And so one of the things that I think is important to just sort of make sure that we all have clearly is that it's not because of this complication during pregnancy that later leads to trouble with your heart. It's that during the pregnancy, this symptom presented itself because it was an underlying problem that you had probably, right? And that that is sort of a foreshadowing of something later. That's the hypothesis. You know, that was always kind of the, you know, the chicken versus egg question. And we're now starting to think that it's more that it's unveiling an underlying predisposition um, to cardiovascular disease. But it, it's still not 100 percent. You know, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to really figure out, is it the chicken or the egg? And so in terms of the research, like what we know about heart disease what percentage of that research has actually been done on women? It's been very, very poor. So traditional clinical trials are have a very poor uh, inclusion of women, um, less than 30% in most uh, clinical trials. And some, you know, in, in the in the past didn't even include women because women were um, often excluded because they were, you know, either at risk of becoming pregnant or, you know, had been pregnant. And so there's been recent pushes, especially by the NIH, by the FDA, to include women in trials, both for testing drugs, for testing devices, and for um, particularly clinical trial research. You actually have to now state why you're not including women or be specific in, in the uh, inclusion of women. And this goes for animal research as well, that we not only need to study male mice, we naturally need to understand if our mice are men, you know, our, our mice are female or male. And that's a requirement now for all our research studies funded by the National Institute of Health. But I feel like as somebody who's like really in the trenches on this, I would love to hear sort of when you realize that there were sex differences, you know, and you can speak specifically to the work that you do. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I can, I just sort of like have this imaginary scene in my head of being in med school and learning all this stuff and being really excited about, you know, the mechanisms of action and the studies that have been done and building upon this research. And then when you at some point realize like so much of this is really about men's bodies rather than women's bodies. Did you ever have a moment like that? I did. And, and, and actually in medical school, uh, we weren't taught sex differences in, in, in health other than just what we traditionally understand as, um, you know, bikini medicine, where you just focus on breasts, health, uterine health, reproductive health. That was really the only kind of sex. Oh my God. I love that you just called that bikini health. That's like so funny. <laughs> 
Right. That's, you know, that was traditionally what was thought as women's health is, um, is more gynecologic um, health, but it's much more than that. And we're, and we're seeing these differences in rheumatology, we're seeing these differences in cardiology. And the main difference for me was that because I didn't have that background, when I was an intern taking care of a woman with chest pain, and realized, oh my goodness, there's so much more than just looking at the angiogram. You know, the angiogram was used to be kind of the end all be all. <laughs> if you had a blockage, there you go. That explains your chest pain. But then understanding that women can actually have ischemia. Ischemia, we, you had mentioned earlier, is a term for poor blood flow to the heart muscle. So we are, we can actually diagnose ischemia in the absence of obstructive coronary artery disease, that there are functional abnormalities of these heart vessels that are more common in women than men. Uh, men can have them too, as I mentioned, but that we need to go beyond just looking at anatomy. Um, we have to look at physiology. That was really the breakthrough <laughs> that I had. And, and a particular example was uh, the woman that I took care of it was actually a patient in our Women's Heart Center, and she had seen multiple doctors for her chest pain, was always told, you know, because her angiogram was normal, was quote unquote normal, that her pain was unlikely related to her heart. And so here um, at Cedar sinai we specialize in a type of test called coronary reactivity testing that specifically evaluates the function of the small vessels um, and the large vessels, and we're able to diagnose her with microvascular dysfunction. And to my surprise, you know, she burst out crying, not because she was sad that she received this diagnosis, but that finally... <laughs> someone kind of recognized that there was something going on in her heart. It was more of a crying of, of relief um, was what she explained, um, that it wasn't just in her head. You know, she was kind of labeled that this is this chest discomfort is just in her head or it's just related to stress. But now, you know, there was a way that we could identify it and then now treat it. I feel like we hear that story all the time on this podcast. It's like, <laughs> like you want to believe that it's not in your head, right? Like that you're really experiencing this thing and you get a diagnosis and you're like, there's a sense of relief because if you can identify a problem, then it becomes something that you can manage, right? Whereas if you're constantly told like it's not this thing, that your instincts are saying it is, that yes. becomes troubling in a, you know, sort of a psychological way. Absolutely. So it sounds like you were already at the Women's Health Heart Center when that happened. Yes. I, well, I was um, a trainee at Cedar sinai but had uh, worked with Dr. Barry Mers with this uh, particular reactivity testing. So because of her, really, was exposed to these sex differences in heart disease and um, became even more interested in understanding how we can better diagnose this, um, both invasively, um, as I mentioned, through the reactivity testing, but also non-invasively. You know, we need better tests that are specific to women. And so I've been working over the past uh, 10 years almost in this field. One of the like basics that I'm still not clear on is that like sometimes people have heart attacks and they die, right? And sometimes people have heart attacks like at home and they don't even realize it until they have like another one or there's some other event. And then in the diagnosis of the second or multiple, yes. they see that there is this scar tissue. Can you talk a little bit about, is there a progress or a progression, I guess, to this? Or do women suffer from these, since the heart attacks are slightly different, do they mm -hmm. also build in some sort of escalating fashion or? Yes, that's an excellent question. So we do know that unfortunately, about half of acute heart attacks can present as sudden cardiac death. And so it's kind of their first time presenting with the symptom. And, and that's why it's so important to, for everyone, even if they have no symptoms, to really understand their risk factors. You know, do they have high blood pressure? What is their cholesterol level? Do they have diabetes? It's very important for them to exercise regularly and eat healthily, avoid smoking. And so what the studies have shown is that actually some women who are actually both men and women who exercise regularly can build up a greater network network of their small little vessels that can form collaterals. So what that means is that even if a big block, big artery 
gets blocked. The little vessels, due to conditioning from exercise, strengthening, can then help create little networks to allow blood flow to still go to the heart muscle, even when a big blockage is occurring. So sort of like a river that's like dammed off and then like little streams form. Little streams, exactly. And that that type of network improves with exercise. We also know that, for example, if a woman has a heart attack, not due to a big blockage though, so as I referred to, you know, due to either microvascular dysfunction or spasm, um, from our WISE data, that there is still a um, 8% risk of scar tissue, meaning that they actually have heart attacks when there's no um, obstructive coronary disease. And there's a risk about a 1% new heart attacks or new scar that can be formed in the next one year. When we looked at those women who had scar, about a third of them were actually never told that they had a heart attack. So that led us to believe that these women were having underdiagnosis of their heart attacks because they may either just be suffering in silence or it just wasn't recognized that their symptoms were due to their heart. Is there any kind of way to check in on your heart, I guess, without undergoing a more invasive kind of procedure? Like I'm thinking of like C-reactive protein, which is like what I say about everything to check your inflammation. <laughs> But I just I sort of wonder, like, are there other ways of women being aware of like whether they have had a heart attack or are at greater risk? Let's try to split that up into two questions. One for someone who doesn't have any symptoms. We encourage these women to really understand their cardiovascular risk. So this risk calculation risk calculator that I mentioned, there was an update in the risk calculator uh, guidelines um, by the American Heart Association and by the American College of uh, Cardiology for determining, helping a woman and a man to determine whether they were um, at risk for having a heart attack or stroke. And this was published in 2018. And you can actually go online, you can Google uh, something called the ASCVD risk calculator, which is also known as the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk calculator. Um, you put in your age, you put in whether you're a man or a woman, you put in your ethnicity, you put in the actual blood pressure numbers, your cholesterol numbers, whether you smoke or smoked or currently smoke whether you have diabetes. So these risk calculators will then give you an estimate of your risk for having a heart attack or stroke over the next 10 years. And the guidelines now have created extra points that if you have certain certain risk enhancers, depending on, for example, family history, the pregnancy um, outcomes that I had mentioned, you know, that are specific to women or having premature menopause, being South Asian in, in, in ancestry, you know, there are certain additional risk enhancers. Oh, another one is the rheumatologic conditions, these kind of inflammatory conditions that will then add to your uh, risk. So I think it's important for all patients, men and women, to know what their risk is by, by going to their doctor to have this calculated. And then for a woman in particular who's having symptoms, so whether this is feeling short of breath that's new when you exercise or having any sort of kind of um, discomfort really above the waist, if it's chest, if it's seen, even if it seems kind of atypical, you know, in the past, people would always focus on whether these symptoms would occur with exercise and if they would get better with rest. But we now know that women can have these symptoms, even with emotional stress, it may happen kind of at random times during the day, not always consistent with exercise. And if this is really persistent, they should have an exercise treadmill test as a first step for generally low-risk women. And there are the next steps depending on what their treadmill shows. But if, you, if these symptoms are persistent and, and they notice that, it's, that it is beyond just being you know, deconditioned, for example, that they should pursue further uh, understanding and not to always take no for an answer. I'm Emily Kummler, and that was Empowered Health. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to check out our website at empoweredhealthshow.com 
for all the show notes, links to everything that was mentioned in the episode, as well as a chance to sign up for our newsletter and get some extra fun tidbits. See you next week.